Good morning, church. This morning's scripture reading will be Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end of the confidence we had at first. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. All right, let's see if the Bible's out together. It's not on the screen, but let's see if we can do this. All right. This is my Bible. It contains God's will for my life. I can become what it says I can become. Okay, I will study from his word. My mind is alert. My heart's receptive. I'll never again be the same. Great to see you if you're visiting with us. It is an absolute honor to have you here. Should we be surprised at the hostility of men? Let me see if there's scriptures before that. Yeah, I need to back up here. We shouldn't really be surprised at the hostility of men. John says this, we know that we are the children of God and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. That's a banner that I wish we had the ability to flag sometimes on the screen again and again. I am looking at the children of God this morning. At the same time, the reality is the world is under the control of evil. It, it, it looks like, in fact, that evil is absolutely in charge. Now, it's temporarily been given latitude. But ultimately, God is in charge. Just look back through history and you'll see it. It's hard to see it at the moment. Then he says, we know also that the Son of God has come has given us understanding so that we know him who is true and we are in him who is true even his son Jesus Christ he is the true God and the eternal one the Bible is still the selling book in all the world I don't know if it's the most read book in all the world but God has made his Made what he wants us to know about him known two ways. It's through his word, and the word contains information about the Christ who came and lived in the flesh, as we do. And he's done this so that we can know that he was true. You know, the, the world sometimes talks about, you know, uh, he, he's a Nazi or he's this or she's this, and some crazy stuff. We don't have to worry about that. We get to know the one true God, even in Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and something we really need to know, eternal life. We should not be surprised at the people in the world. Think about it. The uh, last six, six, four, five, six months, the turmoil in Israel, evil has just been stirring the pot. For the last year and a half, evil in the Ukraine. And it is a tragedy with every life that dies because every one of those lives came from God. But the greatest tragedy of all is that many of them died and they do not know Jesus Christ. Disciples of Christ, I think the most urgent question for us is, will our faith endure? If something happens to happen to us or something happens to us physically or as a patient or whatever, will our faith endure? Because that's the question Robert read for us a moment ago. Will our faith be, will our faith sustain? That was the question that the Hebrew writer asked. What is the opposite of endurance? 
believing in. Not being able to sustain. Looking ahead in the world and looking head on at the world. Will you be worn out? Worn down? To the point that you will say, never mind. Will there be things coming to your mind and your face that will cause you to join the quote, I should have put quote, believers, illusion of safety? You know, COVID pretty much shattered that, did it not? Most of us had grown up, you know, if you if you run into a problem, you, you go get a shot or you take some pills or you do some process and it goes away. The hope was given up by, say, 300,000 Americans 1.4 billion worldwide. They died. They died of something they couldn't even see. Eighty years ago in Germany, there was a <clears throat> church founded known as the Confessing Church. The church was founded in opposition to what was already there, in opposition really to the German Christian Church movement. Really, which was really nothing more than Russian propaganda, you know, given out in the name of worship. The principal main teacher of that group was a man named, who is it? Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You ever heard of him? He was a, he was, he was a university professor at the, at the University of Berlin. And he built this group of people, these believers, into a community of, listen, those who were learning, worshiping, friendship, shared ministry, and hospitality. I found this really exciting as I thought about the time in which he lived. And it was important for every facet of this to exist in their world. The Bible at the center of their work, Jesus is at the center of their life. Actually, in 1937, before Hitler got spun up and became the, the psycho that he was, the believers were closed down by the Nazis. They were harassed by the Gestapo. That same year, Bonhoeffer published a book called The Cost of Discipleship. You can still read it. It's interesting. It was basically a group of lessons that says, how can we as a community be sustained when life lived on the brink. At any moment, the bank, they can come by. At any moment, they can do anything to us. That would be like, I'm not saying it happened to happen, but that was from brothers and sisters. They lived on the brink of community every moment. I wonder if we feel that way, if we feel like, you know, I'm, I'm going to eat, I'm going to take a nap, I'm going to do this tomorrow, I'm going to come back and repeat that. If you didn't know if you would see the people in this room again, would that make a difference in how you viewed this moment in your life? 1943, Bonhoeffer was arrested. And 10 years later, in the Flossenburg concentration camp, he was hanged by the Gestapo. I told you that story because I wanted you to see, and I believe he was correct in saying that it's essential in the church life to encourage one another daily, so long as it's called today. I believe that's what his movement was about. The idea of togetherness helps us in keeping our souls from being destroyed. Paul writes to Timothy, you may fight the good fight, holding on to the faith with a good conscience. Some have rejected these, and so they have shipwrecked their faith. Shipwreck, shipwreck was a common thing. Everybody understood what happens when you have a wreck with a ship. It's done. He said that can happen to your faith. Without your faith in Jesus, what do you have? nothing. You may have everything. I'm amazed every year. I, I usually Google 
who in Hollywood committed suicide this year? Shh, you can listen to me. How many suicides? And you go and there's hundreds of people into their lives, and some of them are billionaires. Some of them had all the popularity you could stand. I mean, it's been a few years now, but think about Robin Williams. He was, he was a guy that made everybody laugh. Yet he couldn't live the life that was a facade. Without Jesus, we have nothing. I want to give you a few, two or three points this morning, and, and the lesson won't be long, but I'm going to give you a few things to help us fight against an unbelieving heart. How can we preserve it? He says this, see to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from, us, from a, the living God. So when he says, see to it, there must be something that I can do. God doesn't ask me to do something that he doesn't give me the wherewithal to take care of it. So I need to do something to make sure that I don't have a sinful unbelieving heart. I'd like for you to read all of chapter 3 this afternoon. It won't take you long, but down toward the end of the thing, he talks about this. He says, Israel was not able to enter into the promised land. One place, is he, one place he says, because of their unbelief. The next verse he says, because of their sin. A lack of belief is sin. What, what, what's the belief? It's belief in God. God says, you don't believe in me? There's nothing else. Can you imagine? I don't know. Somebody's said maybe two million people crossed out of Egypt. God freed them. They moan. They complain. They grumble. And God gets it. But finally, they just rebel. They're just like God tells them this. And I, I'm not going that way. I'm going this way. That says, okay. You are going into the promised land, the place that I had designed for you. I was going to give it to you, but instead you're going to die in the desert. Everyone over the age of 40, you're not going. It wasn't that God hadn't secured the place. It was because of their sinful, unbelieving heart. I don't think that there could, ble could, could possibly be a clear call for us to be absolutely resolute in our belief, in our faith. Stick to it. Do not wear it out. Don't let your heart become evil. Be determined. These are all synonyms, all right? Don't fall away from God. The real danger that you and I face as disciples is in real time. When he said that to them, it wasn't like, now, now some down, time down the road, you may face this. It was, oh, I'm telling you right now, watch your faith. Don't let it become unbelieving and sinful. Don't blow this off. Unbelieving heart turns away from a living God. Now, we have security, security in Christ, and we're going to talk more about that in a moment. But he's saying, don't forget this example. Don't forget what Israel did. Don't forget the first generation. They could have gone. So what's my option? Exhort one another. In contrast to unbelief, encourage one another daily as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. I, I don't want to underline deceitfulness because by, by sin's very... <clears throat> Satan's native language is what? Lying. That's his native language. What language does he speak? Lying. So sin is deceitful. I can think back to any sin that ever took over my life for a period of time. It deceived me. It said, you can't live without this, Jerry. You must have this. You need it more than you need your next breath. So don't be hardened by that deceit. Everybody's going to have it flash through. You can just get it out. He said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in the rebellion. That could be two, 
taken two ways. Do not hear, do not harden your hearts today. That because tomorrow's another day, and then that day, and that, or it could be today. While you have a day, while you have a specific moment in time that may never come back, that may never come back. Don't harden your heart. One protection against an evil heart of unbelief. This is real important. When believers speak faith-sustaining words in your life to encourage one another daily. Faith sustaining words. Have you ever had a thought about somebody? I, I'll just use myself. Ever thought about somebody and you're, you're going along a life or you're at home or you're driving or over in the kitchen or here somewhere and you think, you're thinking about something and you're like, I come to my senses and I go, what? Jerry, what are you thinking? Get it out. Get it out. Am I thinking bad? Why, why am I thinking bad? We've got more to say on that in a moment, but we need to say words to each other that helps us live our faith. Speak words that, you ever been over to Superior Dairy? Man, those three scoops, you know that's over a gallon? And I can eat the whole thing. I didn't say I should, I just said I could. Now I didn't say that was nourished, so I just had to go over there to get your attention. But there are things that nourish us spiritually. This is real important. This is another one of those refrigerator things. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. But only what is helpful for building others up according to what? According to their needs. That it may benefit those who listen. I don't think the text is talking about swearing. So to curse at one another wouldn't be good. But I think he's talking about there are things that I could say. There are things when you ever you ever thought, I just need to bite my tongue. I don't need to say, I don't get away. I don't need to think it. I mean, I've had to say to myself, to myself, Jerry, get away. Don't let any kind of talk come out which is not helpful in building up others according to their needs which means i must be sort of perceptive i must ask god for wisdom i need not to look at someone's failures but what can i say to help this person do not grieve the holy spirit of god with which you're sealed by the day of religion of redemption god has Put his stamp, not on you, but in you. I am looking at people who have in them the Spirit of God. You know, we don't get excited about much, do we? The most excitement I've ever seen in this building was when Danny Martinez was baptized and he came up out of the water and he goes, Hallelujah! And you know, the walls are still here. Building caught on far later, but it wasn't Danny's fault. We can talk about the Holy Spirit being inside us. We're like, no, that's good. Are you kidding me? What do we have to do to have somebody get excited about the fact that God placed his spirit inside of us? sealed for the day when he comes back and said that spirit says you belong to me you're coming with me and said like that to grieve is to feel sorrow feel sick in the heart i keep reminding us that one of our tasks as sheep in the flock is to make our shepherd's job a joy 
but we should also make the Holy Spirit which, which lives in us glad that it's there, not grieved, not sad, not sorrowful. Because it's placed there until God comes back and says, you are going home with me. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That last phrase should be the one that causes us to wrap it around the rest of the text. Get rid of, which says what? It's possible for me to have bitterness or anger or slander. Probably more like slander. But every form of malice. Look, look, malice, these are synonyms. Vengefulness, spitefulness, evil intent, vindictiveness, animus, evil will. Be kind passionate, forgiving each other. How did Christ forgive us? Anybody remember? When we were sinful, ugly, and absolutely unlovable. At that moment, he said, I love you. I'm going to show you how much I love you. God has designed us as disciples so that we will give faith-sustaining words to each other. You and I are the tools or instruments that helps keep alive the faith of other disciples. We are a band of Christians. I prefer to use the word disciple because I know as a disciple, Jerry is a learner. I will be a learner till they put me in an earner, urn or whatever it is. Box, throw it under a tomato plant, whatever you do. But I will be involved in that. Just like God is not going to evangelize the world without human faith awakening voice, neither is he going to preserve the church without human faith sustaining voices. I encourage one another daily. That means all of us, not just preachers. We depend on each other to live through the period of time we're in, whatever that is, to the end in faith. Do you do that? Do you need that? Would you, would you like someone to put their arm around you occasionally and hug you and, and say something like, I love you, or are you doing okay? And really look in your face like, not like, are you doing okay? And walk away. How are you doing, really? What's the evidence from the text we read? What is the evidence that we will do that for each other? Because we've come to share in Christ that which we had at the first. What was the first? When you were baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins, that was a moment. We've all experienced that moment, all in different ways. I mean, I, I was at a group place one time, and this the guy came in, and he was, he was really stoked. He was ready to do anything. We're, we're ready to build a building, and he said, let's build it for 400. We're like 80. We said, well, let's build it for 200. And we'll build it so that we can just knock the wall out and keep on going. Six months later, you couldn't find him. He just literally disappeared off the scope. We have evidence that we will help each other. Because we share in Christ together, just like we did from the beginning. That's proof of the new birth. I think this is to me one of the most significant verses of the Hebrew writer. It makes certain that if a person has come to share in Christ, 
He will help you hang on to the end. And God forgive us when we don't do that or don't make ourselves available and don't look for the opportunity to do that. It's not just logic. It's not, you know, the sequence of verbs that here that's important. Holding on when you want to give up is evidence that you're really sold on Jesus. It's been a moment where you wanted to give up almost as much as the next breath, right? But you didn't give up. God himself said he will sustain us. We'll, we'll talk about this more at the end. He'll sustain us. So stay with me. We've come to share in Christ if, 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 if we hold firmly to the end the confidence we had at first. Holding on to the confidence to the end doesn't get you a share in Christ. It proves you already have a share in Christ. Read this together. Hold, let's read it together. Holding your confidence to the end doesn't get you a share in Christ. It proves you already have a share in Christ. Perseverance is the evidence you've been born again. It's not the means to it. To put the point negatively, if you don't hold on to the confidence, what's the end? So I want you to see that by implication, this text is talking about the eternal security of the disciple that he has in Christ, or she has in Christ. If you're truly a disciple, you are justified, forgiven of your sin through saving faith. You're not perfect. You never will be. But you're going to do your best to live that way. This is what John said. This is how we know it's the last hour. They went out from us. They did not really belong to us, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. I'm not talking about struggling or needing help or just being so broken that all I can do. The text is not. I hope if you see me wander away, you at least come and try to ask me. on the door and he opened the door and opened he said what are you doing here and I said what are you doing here can I come in we can't God forgive us we haven't really got a handle on this yet we're working on it we can't allow people to just disappear our shepherds struggle with this you know, there are people today who are not encouraged because they're not here. They're encouraged. And they may come a day, a week, or, and they're, they're gone for six, eight weeks. And they struggle. You know, they, they try to call, they don't answer, they try to text, they don't respond. You know, they respond. You see them on Facebook, they're alive. Not to allow anyone to slip away. We need each other, church, so desperately to be a part of God's plan as the church, as his disciples, as a group, as a unit, as a community. We need each other to help remain faithful. So here's the summary of staying on the course. Don't let your heart become evil. Don't let it become to the point that you're just going to walk away. Second, as a means of protecting each other from an evil heart of unbelief, 
speaks sin defeating faith sustaining words every chance you get and in the 60s 16 17 years old we were at a youth rally in Portoville and you know somebody came up and said Jesus loves you yeah, I don't know what to do with that I really didn't Dale I, well, yeah, I'm pretty sure he does. And he kept doing that. And pretty soon I thought, you know, Jesus does love me. He wasn't doing it to be mean. He was just doing it to try to get my attention. He probably saw my head going around crazy. And he's like, Jesus loves you, Jerry. We need to speak sin defeating. We need to encourage people. We need to speak faith sustaining words. That There needs to be a vocabulary that we develop. Philippians 1, here we go, <clears throat> being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I don't know what God started in you, but I know that God wants to continue to work that through you until the day of Jesus. Jesus will carry us on to completion. You know the story is told about a guy, there's a bunch of footprints in the sand, and suddenly there's one set of footprints, and the guy says to Jesus, you know, where were you? He said, when there's only one set of footprints, I'm carrying you. First Corinthians, he will keep you strong to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. This comes from a person who makes promises that cannot lie. Good news? Good news? <laughs> Those who are born again are secure in their relationship with God and faithful. If you're persevering today in your faith. It's because of the blood of Jesus. And what gives that blood power is his resurrection from the dead. That encourages us and sustains us. One more hanging on text. There's a lot of them, but I'll just one more. Looking forward to the, to the day of Christ and his church, when it's going to come, Jeremiah says this. I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear me for their own good and the good of their children after them. Israel didn't do that. They had prophet after prophet after prophet and they would say, put down your idols and the people go, nah, 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 something like that. I will give them singleness of heart and action so they'll always fear me for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never, never, never stop doing good to them. I will inspire them to, the word means to be in awe of me. I will rejoice in doing them good and I will surely plant them in this land with all my heart and soul. I am standing in the land that Jeremiah spoke of. We need a singleness of heart and action. We need to be so in awe of God that we say to our children and grandchildren, let me tell you how great God is. You should have a whole repertoire of stories. If you don't, make them. They're in the Bible. The Holy Spirit is working to preserve your faith. God is working in you by the spirit that God gave you when you were born again into Christ. The Father planned it. Jesus bought it. The Spirit applies it. I, I get it. There's no competition. They're all the same. But that's the revelation. God planned the whole thing. Jesus bought it. And, and the Spirit says, yeah, I'll apply it to you. I'll come and live in your life. I'll dwell in you. You will be my temple. The one I really always wanted to live in. Not that little place in, in the desert. Not that place... In Jerusalem, as magnificent it was, where I want to live is in you. God is totally committed to our security. 
because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I ask you at the beginning, will your faith in Jesus endure? Listen closely. The necessity of a body group or community is the plan of God to help maintain the security of disciples. Being here isn't checking a box on Sunday. Being here is a means by which your faith is sustained. If I don't give you anything to sustain your faith, then I need to go somewhere else. The elders need to say, get out, and we'll find somebody that will do it. If we don't encourage each other by rubbing our, our, ourselves, this is all right, rubbing shoulders, being close, there's a problem. Encourage one another daily. Remain faithful as disciples here. If not, he should have said exhort yourself, right? We exhort one another, but he didn't say that. I mean, that's what he said, but otherwise he'd say, well, just exhort yourself, Jerry. That didn't work very well. I I'm not a very good self-exhorter. That may sound as though it's too good to be true, that, like we're, we're way too fragile for this to be involved in because our, our community life is far from perfect, but we're not too fragile. Because it's no more fragile than the sovereign power of God to bring others into your life and to send others into theirs. And God has the power. If you need a reminder, go to Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. He'll talk about the power, the mighty power which he used to raise Jesus from the dead. Eh, that'll work. We end where we began. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the believing God, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We've come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the confidence we had at first. And has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. What a sight you are to see. Men and women who made a commitment to follow Jesus. Not perfect, but we will be. Well, Jesus sees us at now, but one day, we talked this morning in class, in the blink of an eye, boom, we'll be changed. I get rid of these titanium hips and this artificial shoulder and the knees that don't work. Everything that's corruptible is gone. So be with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. If you're not in Christ, oh, I can't even, I don't, I, I haven't done it. I won't tell you how important it is for you to be there. But if you'll talk to me, I'll, I'll talk to you some more. We sing an invitation song. It's our tradition. If we can serve you, let us know while we stand and sing.